the development of 4.5 catched up, uh, the main development phase and the merge window ended 11 days ago. So uh, thanks to that, I can already, uh, it's already possible to see which features the next kernel version brings. And actually, you can uh, pr quite predict when this kernel will come out. It's likely the uh, March 14th uh, when, will, when Linux 4.5 will come out. So what's new in those kernels? Uh, Linux 4.4 brought an uh, <coughs> enhancement for a driver that's called VertIO GPU. Um, and that enhan en enhancements uh, make something uh, possible that's called Virtual 3D. Basically, it's, uh, G you can use GPU ac acceleration, so 3D ac acceleration in a VM. Uh, but before you uh, conclude, you can uh, use Windows with 3D in your VM now. That is not possible it's just for Linux guests. So if you're uh, running um, uh, GNOME 3 or an, another and uh, <coughs> compositing desktop modern in your VMs, you in the future will be able to get GPU acceleration in them and uh, everything, uh, uh, the, uh, the graphics interface might be a bit quicker thanks to that. Actually, it's not only in the kernel what's needed for that. Uh, you also need a, a new QMU version and the latest MISA. And uh, there are a few, f there's a lot of fine tuning still needed. Um, I guess the next Fedora release um, might be able to, you, you might be able to use the feature there. Um, but uh, there are a lot of, uh, a few other things uh, forthcoming to make it even e easier to use. And so that might take a little bit longer until it's simply usable without fiddling in your system. <coughs> what else? Um, 4.4 brought uh, a, a new um, graphics driver that's called VC4. That's actually a graphics driver for the different Raspberry Pis. Um, you might ask, hey, why, why do I need a new graphics driver for that? There are already drivers for that. Um, the thing with this driver is he does most of the things on its own. The drivers you used to use uh, in the past or currently on the Raspberry Pi basically hands a lot of things over to a property driver in the firmware. And um, you, that makes a lot of things uh, harder and unflexible sometimes. And the new driver uh, is like a real uh, Linux driver. Uh, it doesn't support 3D acceleration yet, but we get back to that later. <coughs> uh, for the sysadmins amongst you, um, uh, what Linux 4.4 brought was um, a locked uh, support for MD RAID for uh, 5 and 6. Um, that's something you can use to prevent RAID corruption when the system crashes, uh, crashes while uh, writing a new stripe. Um, <coughs> that's actually a bit similar to what's used in file system. You write something, uh, they, that's called journal. You write out what you're planning to write and then you actually write it out for real and if the system crashes in between, um, you can uh, do the transaction from the lock or get back to the old uh, stuff. Uh, you actually need a separate drive for that, so um, even more drives for, for your big rate, up, <coughs> rate setup. But if you're caring about um, data integrity, that's important because it fixes the right hole where, where data uh, the right rate might get uh, disturbed if you don't do that. <coughs> what else? There were some uh, improvements to the TCP stack and the lock <coughs> locking. Uh, what the de developer wrote um, is uh, two years ago you were like uh, po it was possible to do like about uh, 20,000 synths uh, per second, so the part of the handshake. Um, uh, you, you do when two uh, systems connect. And um, thanks to the new improvements over the past few years and what got into Linux 4.4 and with the proper software and if you use everything that's possible, it's now possible to do 6 million cents per second. So quite an achievement over the past few years. And um, that actually doesn't uh, uh, only make things faster. It makes um, distributed uh, denial of service attacks also harder because you need way more systems to bring uh, a certain server down. That uh, were some of the most important features from Linux 4.4. <coughs> if you want to know more details, you find them in the net. Colonel Newby has a good uh, overview LWN and uh, the German stuff on HiSDE for those that speak German. <coughs> so, 
what's coming for 4.5. Uh, there actually comes the uh, Raspberry Pi driver again. That's uh, getting 3D support in 4.5. <coughs> so um, everything needed to do 3D, the actually 3D driver is not part of the kernel. That's, as always, part of MESA. And that's also, that driver is also in the latest MESA release already. So basically, you have now a few uh, a real open source graphic driver stack for the Raspberry Pi. Um, that, but it still needs some fine tuning. So if you just want to use it, um, you might be better off to simply use what the, the driver stack that, that uh, most of the Raspberry Pis use these days. But in the future, uh, these drivers uh, are likely to make a few things better and more flexible. For the gamers out here, um, there's PowerPlay support coming for a uh, driver that's called AMD GPU. Um, this driver supports um, a, a lot of recent uh, and current um, AMD Radeon drives. And this PowerPlay support um, makes read clocking and power management possible on those cards. And pre uh, precisely, that's uh, here are a few Radeon uh, cards that benefit from that. Those cards in the past um, simply used uh, a standard base uh, 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 frequency and couldn't switch to their quickest or, <coughs> slow, uh, or, or mo most power efficient <coughs> um, uh, settings because there was no read clocking. So, Thanks to the PowerPlay support, we can now switch to the fastest mode and get more 3D performance, or switch to lower, uh, 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 lower modes, and the power consumption is not that bad anymore. Yeah, actually, uh, improves graphics performance, yeah. But it's disabled for now, so if you want to use it, you have to enable it in your kernel config. It's, uh, as far as I know, uh, enabled in the Fedora Rawhide config and in my own kernels also. Uh, but that's not enough. You also need to boot the kernel with a special parameter that's uh, mentioned here. Um, that will change over, t <coughs> over time. Then it will get enabled automatically, so you don't have to care anymore. It will simply work. That's act actually the plan. Maybe that even happens for 4.5. That remains to be seen. Another new feature in 4.5 is something coming from Android. It's um, a sock destroy function that uh, makes it possible for the admin or um, man uh, network managing uh, software like the network manager to terminate open TCP connections um, if you want to do that. Um, the idea behind that, if you leave your house with your notebook or your smartphone and uh, you get out of the reach from your wireless LAN and switch to mobile uh, data networks, uh, uh, streaming <coughs> doesn't work, uh, stops working normally because uh, the TCP timeout time is typically one or two minutes. So uh, until the application that's displaying your stream notices that the um, TCP connection that was used until uh, you left your house isn't available anymore, this, the buffer is already empty and you get a black screen. And now the um, network manager can tell um, the, uh, all applications, hey, this connection closed, and they can um, re-establish a different uh, connection and um, together with a big enough puffer, uh, buffer, they can, um, <coughs> uh, there's no interruption in your stream. A bit low level, but maybe some of you might be interested in, there's a new C group interface, it's called C group uh, uh, version two, and that actually is a basically revamped um, control groups feature. Um, the old uh, C groups feature that is used to um, limit how many CPU time or network bandwidth or storage I.O. you can use, so resource um, <coughs> control. Um, it had a lot of problems. You don't notice if you're running it, uh, just using it via KVM or on your system. But if you're programming it, there are a lot of uh, things where everything is not that good. And that's fixed by the C group uh, 2 interface. System D will support it. So most of you will likely not um, notice that. Things will simply happen in, in the background. Um, but a lot of things should get better there on that level. <coughs> Uh, for the uh, embedded developers around here, what's also it might be interesting that uh, the ARM multi-platform support with 4.5 um, gets mostly finished. That's um, a, a feature to allow what's normal in the x86 world. It's like you 
compile one kernel image and boot it on a lot of different systems that <coughs> wasn't used to be possible in the ARM world. And thanks to the multi-platform efforts, um, that's <coughs> possible these days. So you can boot, compile your kernel for a Raspberry Pi or a Banana Pi and uh, a few other platforms and, um, it, and really use that kernel uh, everywhere. <coughs> it's not perfect yet. There are still platforms where it doesn't work, but this a thought that took uh, like uh, five years is now mainly finished. All the important um, uh, platforms were um, converted a few, uh, some time, for some, some time already, and now with 4.5, even the minor and older uh, platforms get multi-platform uh, uh, multi enabled. That was part one, and now I need to get some oil on my, for my voice. Is there a question? I have three scars here. Maybe one question between each part. If the new driver um, improves the performance, yeah. actually the driver is so new, I guess for now it doesn't improve the performance, but in the end, um, that's the plan, yeah. Okay, and this is yours. So remember when we get to the end of part two, you get a scar. <laughs> so next up, <coughs> part two, the important changes uh, in the past, few, uh, past uh, 12 to 18 months. Uh, one of them is the uh, eBPF, so a four-letter acronym instead of a three-letter acronym this time. It's an extended Berkeley package filter, um, so you might wonder what is that. That is actually um, so, uh, what you might know is the Berkeley package filter, and that's what uh, TCP dump uses um, when, it, when you capture frames from your network. Um, then it actually uh, makes creates a small program that tells the kernel, hey, I'm only interested in these type of um, uh, network communication, and then the kernel only hands those packages back to the to TCP dump. Uh, that prevents quite a lot of overhead and makes some analysis only possible because otherwise there would be so much data, it would uh, slow everything down. And um, in the past two or three years, BPPF was extended to be a simple, uh, simple, flexible VM. VM in this case actually means uh, abstract computing machine like the uh, Java VM, not a virtual machine like KVM or Zen or VMware are able to set up. And you can use this um, abstract computing machine to make some things more, more uh, flexible uh, uh, and improve their performance. <coughs> and um, that allows a few new, new things. And for example, the network traffic control with TC, for example, improved thanks to that. Uh, the performance monitoring will actually use it, is it for some filtering already because during performance monitoring there are so many events, uh, what's happening on the CPU. It's important that to let the kernel filter um, 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 what you're interested in and only hand back that to user space. Otherwise, there would be so much data, it uh, would really slow everything down. And actually, that um, might, in the end, uh, finally make uh, some of the D-Trace features available on Linux, uh, like easy perform um, performance tracing um, <coughs> and performance monitoring for, for your apps. So what, <coughs> what else changed? Uh, there's a feature that uh, UEFI ESRT. That's actually a um, feature where your distribution can put uh, uh, updated firmware somewhere, uh, um, uh, save it in the firmware itself, and then during the next boot, um, there, uh, it's automatically updated. And that actually makes firmware updates as simple um, as, a, uh, as updating every other software. It's actually supported in Fedora 23 already, but the feature also needs to be implemented on, in the hardware, and the first systems that use this feature are getting out now. Remains to be seen if that's something all of us um, um, will be using in two or three years to update our firmware in our not notebooks, servers, or wherever. Another feature that emerged over the past few months was user fault FD. That's a um, feature where you can, which is used by QMU, where you can uh, simply live migrate a, um, a machine over to a different host and without copying all the memory over immediately. 
So um, thanks to that, if the machine was transferred to the new host, it can uh, um, and needs some memory that wasn't transferred already and can simply ask the, the old host, hey, I need this memory now, can you give it to me? And that kind of uh, uh, sounds like it's a bit strange, but actually makes um, uh, live migration possible in situations where the memory changes a lot. Because uh, norm, um, uh, otherwise it wasn't possible to do live migration without a, a long <coughs> disturbance and um, because um, the old machine, the memory changed so quickly that you couldn't transfer it uh, uh, to, the, to the new host or, uh, in the past. There actually is a, was a talk about that on Fostam last Sunday. Um, I guess the video recording is online and on YouTube by now. But I haven't checked. <coughs> what else um, changed over the past few years? The Radeon driver improved quite a lot. That's um, just like the AMD GPU driver I mentioned earlier, a driver for lots of um, uh, AMD Radeon cards, but for an older gen uh, a few older generations. So not only the latest generations, but also those, those that got sold like two and two years ago, and even some up-to-date up uh, cards, current cards, uh, current models are supported by this driver. Uh, this driver improved quite a lot. Uh, so 3D performance in this open source driver um, is now not up to par with the proprietary AMD driver, but it's getting closer and closer. And feature-wise, um, it really gets closer because video acceleration uh, for decoding and encoding works. Power management uh, also got a lot of better. Uh, doing audio over HDMI or DisplayPort um, improved. It's not perfect. Uh, not all of that works perfectly, but uh, the open source driver, driver for the Radeon cards um, really gets to a point where that's the driver you want and you don't want the proprietary driver because it doesn't give you... The, it isn't better, or, and actually in, in some parts it, it's even worse now already. That's not only thanks to the kernel, that's also... Uh, thanks to the user land drivers um, in MESA or LLVM. <coughs> so that were features that happened over the past few months. Um, uh, if now we are zooming back a little bit and um, one of them uh, getting to a meta uh, uh, layer. New versions of the kernel <coughs> these days re really come every nine weeks. Uh, you can nearly bet on that. Um, Sometimes it's one week less, sometimes it's uh, one or two weeks more, but uh, thanks to the, this d development pace, you can quickly uh, you can, uh, see uh, when the next kernel comes and know um, when features will arrive if they got merged. Another meta uh, thing is um, there's a new uh, long-term kernel will now uh, get chosen every January. As I said earlier, the 4.4 kernel released this January is uh, a long-term kernel that will be supported for two years. And um, the kernel that will be up to date next year uh, in January, that will then get chosen to be uh, a long-term kernel. So that's easier for those that run uh, your own kernels to prepare because you know hey, this kernel in January, that will be one that gets two years of support. Another um, thing is that um, it seems like there are one or two security problems in the kernel these days because a lot of people look for security problems there and so one or two come up every, weeks, every week and uh, among them um, a few times per year there are really important ones where you really should uh, update your kernel within a few <coughs> um, days if you really want to be secure or better as quick as possible and uh, so better be prepared for that security bugs in the kernel will happen and you have to change now and then and keep an eye on it. What also changed is um, more and more tools are used to find bugs or things or, 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 or code where bugs could happen. Um, for example there are fuzzing tools that are now being used. Trinity is a tool that's used for three or four years now, now and then to find 
code that is um, not where security problems might show up or other problems. And these days, there's a new tool developed as uh, this caller. It's also doing fuzzing. Uh, the support for that is not yet in the kernel, and the thing is still developed, but already um, it finds quite a few bu uh, bugs. Uh, I think there were about 30 bugs in one of the latest, um, uh, 30 changes in uh, one of the latest stable kernels um, that were fixed um, after uh, this caller found them. There's also um, continuous integration tools now running. There's a K-Build test robot that um, uh, if you send a patch to some mailing list, this robot uh, watches that um, uh, robot grabs the patch and compiles it and um, sends, um, uh, if there are problems, it uh, sends a mail to the mailing list, hey, your patch doesn't uh, work or it, it doesn't compile, and so you get blamed uh, for that actually in, in the open, so better prepare your patches and check if everything works. And there's actually the ARM guys uh, from Linux set up uh, kernelci.org where kernels are constantly tested and booted in QMU to see if everything works. In the news, um, everywhere there were <coughs> a few uh, voices that um, there were development problems like uh, aging developers, lack of contributors, review stalls, and especially the discussion tone between the uh, kernel developers um, <clears throat> Some of you might have heard of Sarah Sharp or Matthew Garrett that said, hey, that's, uh, they are too, it's not, uh, they complained how, how Linus and some of the other um, uh, sometimes talk to each other and uh, said that it has to improve to get new new kernel in. That's actually a quite complex uh, topic. That's why I don't want to go into that here in, uh, any closer. Um, the short version is basically um, a lot of things are way better than five or ten years ago. Um, actually, I noticed when I wrote that uh, that I'm actually looking at kernel development for ten years now. When ten years ago, it was really way more bad. So a lot of things are bad, uh, are already improved. Sure, some things could be better, but that's always the case. Um, and um, it's uh, maybe it's good enough already. Depends. Uh, I, for one, think um, in, in the past uh, year nothing too much out of the ordinary happened. Linus said w once said something really awful, uh, but he didn't say that to a um, uh, developer who was new on the list. It was he said that to some developer he already knew for years. So it's a bit like among friends. Uh, the, the tone is a bit rough sometimes there on the kernel mailing list. So that was part two. I need to voice, uh, oil my voice again. Question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a question about the eBPF thing that you mentioned. Uh, do you know if the, if the eBPF thing is going to be developed, uh, the kernel part and the user level part more in sync than the original BPF code? Because in the past, I've been bitten by some bugs in, in the kernel supporting features in BPF that BPF did, BPF did not generate my code for. So it was kind of easy to get fixes in the kernel and complicated to get fixes in the user level parts? Yeah. I've heard about it, but I'm, mm, I actually can't answer that for sure. I think they, uh, they wanted to make sure that it uh, doesn't diverge too much, but um, it's also not just like a stable ABI. Sometimes you need uh, to, to, to uh, update both, both sides to one, one version. <laughs> Actually, um, um, it's uh, some code to compile eBPF code is in LLVM these, these days. Um, and if you're using it with perf uh, or something, it's quite easy to compile. That's what I know. Um, if you want to know more, there's uh, Daniel Brockman. Um, he's one of the main developers behind that. He gave a presentation past week on FOSTEM about the eBPF and its features, mostly from the networking side. Um, that might uh, have some answers, and you can email him. Thank you. So, next up, wait a moment. Things in the works. <coughs> so, what's coming in the next few months? Um, KDBIS isn't coming. I guess most of you have heard about that. Um, <laughs> 
that was uh, abandoned. What was KDBus, for those that haven't heard about it, was a kernel site replacement for the DBus daemon. So the thing that passes the DBus messages around on your system. And um, the developers said, OK, no, we don't go that direction anymore there and uh, start from scratch again, mostly. And uh, now they are working on making a message bu bus that is more universal. So it can be used for dbus transfers, but it also can be uh, used for other things. Um, the thing is still under development, remains to be seen uh, when we see it for the first time. <coughs> ButterFS. Also something I guess most of you have heard about, it. it's a file system It was uh, in the, uh, 2008 or 2009 uh, considered the next generation Linux default file system. Um, back then it was said it needs some time to, to develop, but I guess nobody expected that 2016 it's still not really finished. And the thing is these days you don't hear so much about it, and I think that's a good thing because developers are stabilizing ButterFS. Um, they find, uh, actually it's used in Facebook already um, because the main ButterFS developer works for um, uh, Facebook these days. And they found a few bugs there and fixed them and uh, made some features that were not completely finished yet, also worked on that. So uh, stabilizing is what's uh, now done there. Question that always comes up, <coughs> comes up then, is it ready yet? And I think that's a question that basically is uh, like uh, asking, is the water safe to go in? If you think about it, the answer always depends on your abilities and your local uh, conditions. Because if you're going to the sea and there's uh, rough winds and uh, tides or something, you might get dragged in even if you're a really good um, swimmer. On the other hand, if you're a really bad <coughs> swimmer, uh, even in your local pond, you can drown. But as I said, Facebook uses this. SUSE also uses uh, it by default on uh, SUSE Linux Enterprise um, Server. And OpenSUSE also uses it. Um, I myself also use it. But actually, before traveling here, I saw that um, ButterFS uh, um, filled my disk already, and I need to run a kind of de defragmentation to get free space again to make ButterFS perform better. So that's something you need to learn. And so ButterFS is not that ready that you can simply use it. It's, I, I'd say for now it's something you, if you're interested in it and want to use the features ButterFS offers, and then learning that and uh, uh, dealing with those, those kind of problems that are still there might be worth it. <coughs> but uh, that's something um, you, you have to choose for yourself. <coughs> Kernel live patching is something that was uh, from the, um, announced uh, two years ago on this conference from the Red Hat head sites. Actually, with a different patch set back then, SUSE also did something to do live patches so to fix security bugs in your Linux kernel without rebooting. And they, uh, SUSE and uh, Red Hat merged their efforts. That's now in the kernel. It's called, as I said, kernel live patching, KLP. The basic function got merged about a year ago, I think. And uh, it, allows about, uh, it allows to fix about 90% of the bugs um, that uh, typically show up in the kernel. Uh, the Red Hat and SUSE solutions actually were able to f fix 95% of the bugs. Um, that's something the KLP de developers work on, um, but there are some roadblocks that need to get solved. Um, if you're interested in deta details, uh, Google for compile stack validation. That's something you need to, st uh, the developers need to um, see where the currently running code is used and how to fix all, uh, all the different places. Um, uh, where it's running currently. Also, things in the work is uh, even more improvements for net network performance. Um, uh, there are so many things coming there. Actually, there's, if you're interested in that, um, there's a talk about that on Sunday at 11.30, uh, kernel network stack changes at uh, 100 gigabit uh, speeds because uh, there are interrupts and uh, create so much uh, overhead and memory allocations, the kernel needs to change to make that happening. Rich ACLs uh, is an improved um, mechanism for access control list. Uh, it's 
con um, more uh, to possible to use, um, uh, to set up a more consistent and more flexible uh, permissions, especially for ACLs, uh, especially for, <laughs> for NFS servers, and especially if you're running uh, uh, NFS v3 and v4 at the same time. I'm running out of time, that's um, because I'm getting quicker and quicker. Um, I guess the uh, SA for AMD, I'm skipping. And the cluster support, um, maybe a few embedded developers are interested in this. Um, the kernel isn't ready uh, uh, for 2038. Uh, that's similar to the problems we had when uh, uh, we switched to year 2000 a few years ago. It's uh, only relevant for 32-bit applications. The kernel needs to, um, to get changed, and file system needs to get changed to make, to store timestamps um, after year 2038. That's actually in the work, and uh, LWN recently wrote that it might get finished this year. Um, I guess that's possible. Maybe it takes a bit longer, and then it even takes a bit longer till user land um, has also um, migrated to handle everything, but we are getting there. Uh, um, some of the BSD actually fixed that already two years ago, but it, it's easier for them for various reasons. Tinification is also something <coughs> um, that uh, a few kernel developers look at now. It's like making the kernel a bit more smaller and uh, reducing the overhead um, to make Linux suitable for uh, Internet of Things devices. There were also some roadblocks where people wanted to reduce the network stack, stack to the really uh, basic functionality, and the network uh, subsystem maintainer said no. That was already years ago. But over time, um, people arrange, and uh, things it, it's getting it's possible to make the, the kernel uh, smaller and smaller to make it uh, more interesting for Internet of Things devices, which actually become. Uh, more powerful thanks to enhancement in processors, so it might be not that much of a problem, so Linux might be used there quite a lot. <coughs> kernel hardening. hardening is also something uh, where a few people um, invest more time these days. Um, it's, uh, they look at, for example, for the GR security um, patch set, uh, which ha has a few security enhancements for the Linux kernel, and those de developers look if they uh, can get those features or uh, some f features like that into the kernel to make security, uh, to improve the uh, security from the basic, um, for, the, for the standard mainline kernel. <coughs> Container is something where not that much happening is in the kernel, but there are a few small changes to improve security and realize new features. Um, C groups, for example, is one of the areas where a few enhancements are, are needed. And that's, so a, a little bit is happening there. Android mainlining is also something that's now around for many years now there, where people try to um, get improvements uh, that are part of the Android uh, kernel get into the mainline kernel. Uh, the uh, network uh, uh, socket destroy function I mentioned earlier is one of those features. Um, but there are still a lot of things in the, in the uh, Android kernel that are not yet part of the mainline kernel. But slowly, if uh, things are getting better, so maybe in the uh, if, uh, year or two, it's really possible to run an Android device with a mainline kernel without any Android-specific patches. Real-time, for those of you that uh, have been here in the earlier talk, that's also something. Uh, where a lot of people are interested in to get deterministic behavior. Um, the situation one year ago looked a bit sad because the developers that are mainly driving that stuff uh, forward to get, get the real-time enhancement into the uh, kernel um, <coughs> needed funding. That situation actually is mostly solved. The Linux Fond uh, Foundation started a collaboration project uh, uh, last <coughs> fall to get that running, and these days there are, I guess, five, um, at least five developers that are get being paid to get the real-time stuff into the kernel. And actually, thanks to that, getting it um, uh, into the uh, KVM also, and then you can do uh, real-time in VMs. That was actually in the talk that was right, was in this room right before this. You can watch it on, on YouTube later <coughs> if you're interested in that. 
That was part three. Getting closer to the end. Question? How many slides are in your slide deck? Um, <laughs> that question is actually asked in a, in, a, in a few minutes. I have a few post slides. Is there an, another question? Was it, was it too quick? I like the format. It's good. OK. How? So when you extract the comment from the kernel gate, how difficult is this to get from there to the live patch for the kernel? Actually, the uh, 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 yeah, you need you need to be a kernel developer and look what what changes. Like uh, if you're doing uh, live patching, if the data structures change, you can't do live live uh, patching, for example. So you have to do a lot of attention to what's going on in there. Yeah, actually, uh, yeah, actually, um, Red Hat and SUSE offer it as a service. Because if you want to do it yourself, you have to be really skilled to do that. So I guess I have a minute. Maybe a few post slides. Um, if you want to know more details, just Google for them. And there are more de details about everything I talked in the web. If you don't find anything, just, just ask me. Um, one thing I normally do on, the, on this um, uh, talks is uh, telling people to help testing the kernel. I'm skipping that uh, because I'm doing a lightning talk today at, uh, eight, uh, at 6.50 or something. It's, uh, I don't know which room. Just look it up in the schedule. I go a bit into that there. Uh, the other thing I wanted to ask you is give me feedback. Uh, I might do this again if, uh, if you don't tell me how bad I was and, uh, or if my English was that bad. And uh, tell the um, uh, organizers also on, on the web page there's a feedback survey. Um, so otherwise they might, me, they might uh, invite me again. And that's actually slide 185. <laughs> that's it. And if, if, you, if there are other questions, simply grab me on, on the hallways or something. Enjoy the conference. So much, I guess maybe I'm not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So very good format. Okay. Thanks.